I don't think I ever will be. And I'm just thankful for that now because there was a time in my life where I was, and I really was alone. The mission of Waymark is to give hope to youth in foster care by forming personal connections and an understanding that God has a plan and purpose for their life. We serve um, over 450 children and teens in the course of a typical year. Well, my name is Christina Maria Perez. I am 19 years of age and I was living in multiple foster homes throughout the years. Waymark has helped me with my life transitions and has put amazing people into my life that are still helping me today and are still supporting me. So we have Royal Family Kids Camp, which is our summer camp for six to 12 year olds. And then we have our teen camp, which is in the fall, and that's for 12 to 17 year olds. And we also have group mentoring as well, and those are called our compass groups. And so we go into group homes and we provide um, you know, a, a weekly um, opportunity for mentors to come in and provide a meal. And uh, it's, it's really, it's a beautiful thing because they get um, so transparent during that time because they feel safe. It's a safe environment. They know they can count on these volunteers. They're there every week. And a lot of the children that come, are in foster care that go to these homes bring their own issues and trauma and their baggage. And so I think the biggest issue is learning how to adapt and survive the system, not you don't have life dreams, you don't have life life goals or nothing. We really want to just lay that foundation and say you are loved and you are valued and God has a purpose and plan for your life. So that's really the most important thing we communicate to them is their value and their worth. When I think about Christina, I just, um, she's just so intelligent, just such a smart young lady with this bright personality and you can't help but love her when you meet her. For me, I appreciate new people. A lot of people have different things to share and teach you. If you do not remain a person who is teachable, you won't learn anything and your opportunities are slim. Yeah, that's, that's it's like, Mr. Doug is like a grandpa and your dad. So I call him Pop Pops. He's also my mentor, so you got all three in one. Now, not all families are perfect. I'm not gonna say that they're perfect either, but they've been kind, patient, more than they should have. It's very important because I struggle with abandonment. You know, it, it's not always perfect and it's not always pretty, um, but they know, they know that they know that they're loved and that they're valued and they know there are people that care about them. We have so many volunteer opportunities, so ranging from writing letters for our kids during the week, um, to taking a meal to one of our compass groups, to being a big camper at one of our camps, which is what we call our counselors, um, to being a mentor, one-on-one -on -one or a group mentor. I feel like it's God sent them. I feel excited that I've had the opportunity to meet some of these amazing people in this program. Sometimes at camp, I'll kind of sit back and I, I just see a glimpse of it and go, wow, like what a joy to be a part of this, um, to be allowed to be a part of this journey with these kids, because they're amazing. These kids are absolutely incredible kids that just need the right opportunity and just need to be connected with the right people and just to know that they matter. And welcome to Hillside Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy and the privilege of serving as the associate pastor here, and it is good to be together today. This is the day the Lord has made, so we're gonna rejoice and be glad in it because we know that God is in this place. As we begin our worship time together, I invite you, if you're able, to stand as we sing together our opening hymn, number 148, Praise Him, Praise Him, and the words will also be on the screens. Let's sing together. Him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer, sing all earth His wonderful 
love proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, highest archangels in glory, strength and honor, give to His holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard His children. In His arms, He carries them all day long. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sing all things, He has suffered and bled and died. He our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail Him, hail Him, Jesus the crucified. Sound His praises, Jesus who bore our sorrows. Love unbounded, wonderful, deep and strong. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals, loud with hosannas ring. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Crown Him, prophet, heaven and priest and king. Christ is coming, over the world victorious. Power and glory unto the Lord belong. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent may be seated. I figured I would, uh, I, I knew you would listen to me if I brought a kid with me, so, and I've talked about her enough, I figured I might as well bring her up here. Say hi. No? All right. <laughs> so we have a couple of announcements before, uh, before we actually move into the, the singing part of worship today, um, and our first announcement is we have a uh, Play a Role Foster Care Awareness Summit coming up on uh, April the 24th at 6 p.m. And so what that is, it's an awareness event uh, to learn about how each of us can use our own gifts and talents to impact uh, our, and strengthen our vulnerable families uh, that are in our community. So I would encourage you, if you're interested in that, we did it last year and it was pretty popular. Um, you can check that out. You can actually go on Hillside's website and actually get more information about that. But April the 24th at 6 p.m., it'll be in our celebration hall, just for, for your information for that. Our second announcement is for the guys of the house, so the men. Uh, we're gonna be having a men's breakfast coming up on April the 27th. Does any, any, anybody like breakfast? Okay, you like breakfast. I like, I, do, do you like breakfast? Yeah, she likes breakfast, but yeah. Anyway, so this is the one event that um, we're gonna have. It's gonna be a little bit early on a Saturday morning. We're gonna have uh, Pastor Hurst is gonna be our speaker. Uh, but if you like bacon, eggs, stuff like that, it's gonna be an awesome time here uh, on campus. So put, uh, put that on your calendar from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. Uh, on the 27th. This is our men's breakfast. And our third announcement is we have a mother-son dance coming up on May the 3rd at 6 p.m. It's $35 per couple. We went to the daddy-daughter dance, didn't we? Yeah, we did. We had a great time. It was, it was fantastic. We uh, ate too much popcorn and uh, cupcakes, right? So that was our dinner for the night, and yeah, I'm still paying for that. So anyway, Mother Son Dance, Mother Son Dance is coming up May 3rd, 6 p.m. So be aware of that, and if you know some folks who are interested in that, it'd be an awesome thing. It'll be here in our celebration hall as well. And then just a quick mention tonight, we have a night of worship scheduled in the celebration hall at 6.30 PM. So if you're if you if you're looking for something to do tonight, we encourage you come out, hang out at that. It should be really really awesome. So those are our announcements for this Sunday. Let's take a moment and prepare our hearts for worship.
I'd like to invite you once again, if you're able, to stand as we join together in our call to worship, which will be found on the screens. We are called to be God's children. God's love has been poured on us through Jesus Christ. Fear and doubt are gone. Joy and celebration remain in our hearts. Come, let us raise our voices in song. Let us offer our hearts and souls to God in prayer and praise. Amen. And I invite you to remain standing as we join together in our next hymn, number 160, I Love to Tell the Story. standing as we join together and profess our faith in the words from the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. 
I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. take your seat, I invite you to turn and greet one another now in the name and love of Christ. privilege at this point to enter into a time of prayer. Um, and before we do that, I want to invite you to, uh, to especially be, uh, be thinking and praying for the family of Randy Wiltrow. Uh, Randy has been a longtime member and leader here at Hillside for years and years. And uh, yesterday, Randy took his final breath on this earth and woke up in all of glory. Um, such a legacy and such a life well lived. Um, I know he has touched many of our hearts and lives, so we invite you to pray for his wife Barbara and their family um, as they grieve and as they discover um, what it is to live day by day without him physically present, but knowing that he is eternally present with God in this moment. So let's go to God in prayer together. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. We resonate with the psalmist when he declared, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Whether we're worshiping in person in the sanctuary or worshiping online, God, we are filled with incredible joy as we worship you today. Thank you that we get to worship you freely without harm or persecution. May we take advantage of this day and this opportunity to worship you with all that we have. And God, you know us so well, inside and out. And you know that we don't always do the things that we should do, and we don't always say the things that we should say. So we are truly sorry for the ways that we have failed you and the ways that we have failed others. God, pour out your mercy on us as we humbly seek your forgiveness. And God, it doesn't take long to realize how blessed we are as your children, from our families, to our friends, to our incredible church community, to this amazing country we call home. We take this moment to realize the blessings we have, and we say thank you. Thank you, God, for your goodness in our lives. And may we not only say thank you with our words, but the ways that we live our lives as well. And today, we lift up our own prayer requests before you. There are so many in our lives who need your healing touch right now. We pray for those who we know and love who are struggling physically, emotionally, relationally, and spiritually. Remind them of your presence and that you are working in and through all things. And God, we also pray for all those who have lost loved ones recently. Embrace them in their time of need. Specifically, God, we pray for the family of Randy Wiltrout. 
Randy was such a faithful follower of yours and had a tremendous impact in our Hillside community and beyond. Thank you for his life and his legacy. And we especially pray for his family as they grieve his loss. And God, in this season of Easter, Eastertide, we continue to remember your incredible sacrifices. You sent your son to die on the cross for us. God, the fact that you love us so much that you went to extreme lengths is truly mind boggling. Fill us with your Holy Spirit that we might strive to become more and more like Jesus every day of our lives and that we might shine your light in this world. It is in the mighty and the powerful name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, that we pray. This prayer and the prayer that he taught his disciples as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's so good to see you, so good to hear you <laughs> this morning. I'm glad for all of you to be here this uh, morning, especially those of you who are guests with us. If this is your first Sunday worship, and we are so glad you're here. 
and also you online as well. Those of you online, we hope to see you in the house sometime soon. Would you bow with me as we pray together? Holy Spirit, breath of the living God, fall afresh on all of us this day. By the power of your Spirit, quicken our hearts and minds to your presence and to your purpose. Open our ears to your voice as it speaks, and by the mystery of your grace, change us. Change us into the people that you have created and are calling us to be. For we make this prayer in the name of the one we call the Christ, Jesus of Nazareth. Amen. If you use technology in any way these days, more than likely you've had to deal with the issue of identity theft. How many of us have received a message from the Nigerian prince asking for your help? <laughs> How many of you have received a message from someone pretending to be me or someone pretending to be a member of our church staff asking for your assistance with a sensitive matter usually involving the purchase of gift cards. To prevent identity theft, it's not uncommon for commercial or government entities to use some kind of identity authentication protocol. And early on, most entities like banks or email services would ask you for information, your information, like your mother's maiden name or the name of your first grade teacher. Now, I get my mother's maiden name but the name of my first grade teacher, seriously? I mean, I sometimes can't remember what I had for lunch yesterday, much less remembering my teacher's name. Fortunately, with the widespread use of smartphones, the authentication process has become more secure and even simpler. Most of us are familiar with what they call two-factor authentication. That's when you log into something like your bank account and before giving you access to that information, the bank sends you a numeric code to your smartphone or your email account, which you in turn return to the bank. And then it's like the key, the bank authenticates your identity to make sure you're not some hacker living in his mom's basement <laughs> trying to steal, siphon off your hard-earned money. Such is the world in which we live. As Christians, authentic identity is very much a concern since the culture in which we live has become at best skeptical and at worst antagonistic toward people of faith, especially Christians. I read a news story a couple of days ago about a, a public elementary school that denied a student's request to start a prayer group in her school. Late last year, nearly 100 Christians were murdered in Africa. What do non-Christians find so threatening about our faith? Are they threatened by the fact that our God is a saving God? That our God is a redeeming God? That our God is a God who loves you the way you are, but calls you to be a whole new creation and not just a better version of yourself? I honestly don't know. Whatever it is, it, it must frighten them. But I guess we shouldn't be too hard on those who don't really understand us, who don't understand what we believe and why. After all, the first disciples, even after the resurrection, didn't fully get it. Listen to the word of God from Luke's gospel, the 26th chapter, beginning at the 34th verse. Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened and, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See, it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Yet for all their joy, they were still disbelieving and wondering. And he said to them, have you anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. 
Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day. And that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. If there ever was an example of the need for identity authentication, it is and was in the days and weeks following the resurrection of Christ. If you remember, on Easter morning, Mary Magdalene thought that the risen Christ was the gardener before Jesus spoke her name, and she became the first person to preach the good news of the resurrection. Later that same day, two of the disciples were walking to the village of Emmaus when Jesus joined them on the road, but they didn't know it was Jesus. And even while Jesus explained to them the meaning of the suffering of the Messiah and the death of the Messiah and the resurrection, they still didn't recognize him. And it wasn't until Jesus broke bread with them at dinner that suddenly their eyes were opened to see him right before he vanished. Realizing what had happened, they hurried back to Jerusalem in the darkness, and they found their companions to tell them what happened. And and as they discussed these appearances with some measure of skepticism, Jesus suddenly stood among them. But instead of acting, reacting with joy and jumping up and down in celebration or even showing uh, some sense of relief at the return of their mentor, their rabbi, their friend, their teacher. The disciples are overwhelmed with fear and completely unprepared for this face-to-face encounter with Jesus. As one scholar wrote, it was one thing for the disciples to hear secondhand reports of Jesus' resurrection. It was something else completely for them to stand in the presence of the living Lord. Now, while some New Testament scholars have taken the position that the disciples' reaction proves that they didn't really believe in the resurrection, others say that the particularities of Jesus' appearances seem to point us in, in another direction, that the disciples may be characterized as frightened, but not necessarily disbelieving. In this perspective, what challenges the disciples is is the nature of the risen Jesus. Luke says that they feared that they were being visited by a ghost, some sort of disembodied spiritual being. When I think of that, I think of the latest version of Ghostbusters, which is out this summer. But I remember the first version was my favorite. That's my favorite. Last October, we explored, if you remember, the the Apostles' Creed. And we learned that one of the many reasons that the early church wrote the creed was to teach that the risen Christ was not some kind of ghost. The creed taught that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified dead, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose from the dead. In fact, in this morning's gospel, Jesus addresses the physical nature of his resurrected body. He says to the disciples, look, look at my hands, look at my feet, inviting them to see the wounds that he suffered as a result of the crucifixion. And that was important for that to happen. That was important for Luke to record that because in that area of the world, there was a folk belief, a folk belief that the feet of ghosts never touched the ground. Inviting the disciples to inspect his feet served two purposes for Jesus. First, to show them the nail holes. And second, for them to see that his feet were firmly planted on the ground. 
In essence, Jesus is declaring that he is absolutely flesh and bone, not some ghost. And as if to put an exclamation point to his declaration, he asks them for something to eat. And only after the disciples see this very human, this very alive Jesus, their Jesus, eating a piece of broiled fish, do their fears recede. Having demonstrated that he is fully present, Jesus does something else that's very interesting. He begins to repeat the testimonies that had been previously offered by previous resurrection witnesses. The question is, why? Why? Well, because according to Torah, the Jewish law, by repeating the testimonies of his, of his resurrection in the presence of his disciples, Jesus transforms his disciples into legal witnesses to his testimonies about his true identity as the Messiah, the one who calls us to repentance and offers forgiveness, as well as to his physically ri risen body. And because now they are witnesses to others about the saving, forgiving, life-changing power of the resurrection, they must now know these facts for themselves in their own lives. The testimonies they would eventually be called on to give is not just some spin, their spin, their interpretation about the truth of the empty tomb, but it is as actual legal witnesses to the risen Jesus. And they will give those testimonies for the rest of their lives. And in fact, those testimonies will, for many of them, be the reason that they lose their lives. When asked to recant, they refused. And they suffered the consequences. Those first followers of Christ who became the foundation of what we call the church, not the building, but the people, in reality became the second stage of the two-factor authentication process for the resurrection. And today, we who claim the identity Christian have inherited the same daunting responsibility of authenticating the truth of the resurrection for our world. But ours is not an easy task given the culture in which we live. A culture in which right or wrong is relative or dependent on context. A culture that indulges our own self-destructive appetites. A culture that treats human beings as commodities to be trafficked or to be exploited or traded. A culture not unlike the world of the Roman Empire. And yet our ancestors, believe it or not, our ancestors managed to turn their upside-down world right-side up. How? How did they do that? By authenticating the resurrection of Jesus with their own lives. You see, the Christians were the ones who rescued abandoned babies from the city dump, especially Girls. No one wanted baby girls. And say, so would just throw them in the dump. The Christians were the ones who gave the dead a decent burial instead of letting the body rot in the field. The Christians were the ones who risked their own safety, their own health, by taking care of those infected with the plague. And if there's something that our world, our culture, our community, our state, our nation need from us, it is that. I call it the, the you factor identification. In other words, Jesus needs you and Jesus needs me to authenticate, to validate his resurrection. Now, how do we do that? Well, first, the early church authenticated the resurrected Christ by being physically present as Jesus was present. The world in which we live, sometimes, you know, how many times have you wanted to just kind of like withdraw? Like, where, where is there a, a, an isolated island that I don't want 
that I can just avoid the rest of the world. I mean, it's not enough just to turn off the TV, cut off internet. You see it everywhere, right? Paul taught that the community of believers called the church was the actual living and breathing body of the resurrected Christ here on earth. Each of us who confesses Christ as Savior and Lord is like a cell in the human body. Some of us are skin cells. Some of us are muscle cells. Some of us are eyeball cells. Some of us are hair cells, which some of us don't have as much cells as others. <laughs> the Holy Spirit then moves not so much in us, but among us, drawing us together to make God's presence felt even as God's purposes are fulfilled. For example, if you've ever been here on Tuesday afternoons, Tuesday nights, when Forever Fed, the line for hungry, hungry folks that we serve, snakes around the building, and regardless of whether or not you are a believer or whether or not you come to church or a member here, there is this palpable sense of something greater going on than just me handing out a box. It's the Holy Spirit. Not moving in us as much as moving among us, drawing us together to fulfill God's purpose. The resurrected Christ calls us to be present as he was physically, emotionally, spiritually. In the church, in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our places of work, in our schools, to be present as sources of truth and sources of grace. Unfortunately, in our overscheduled, overcommitted, hyperconnected, stranger skeptic, always on the go culture, it's sometimes difficult to be present enough, to be present enough to you factor, authenticate the risen Christ. I'm reminded of the story of Julie Baines, who one day was bent over her laptop at the kitchen table, working on a project for her employer. She'd been at it for a few hours, and she remembers her nine-year-old call, calling out to her, and he said, Mommy, 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 if you had a dog, and you really loved this dog, and you worked real hard to earn money to buy him the fanciest dog house and the best dog food, don't you think it would be better if once in a while you played with that dog? <laughs> you back when I'm raking? Okay. Is your life so stuffed to the gills that you can't be present even for a moment? For a friend? For a stranger? Who needs a conversation with, who needs an encounter with the, the risen Christ in you. Now, the second way that we authenticate the identity of Christ is with our personal witness of Christ. Let me let that sink in there for a moment. Some of you just went, ooh! <laughs> that big W word, witness. It's important. I said witness because being a witness is not the same thing as being an expert on Christ. In light of what we've experienced with the pandemic, there's a good bit of skepticism about experts and what experts say. Joao Moraes says that people in modern culture have been conditioned to doubt anything that tries to explain everything. To doubt anything that tries to explain everything. People are suspicious of religion, of course, but also of science. People reject pastors and theologians, of course, but also doctors and researchers. We live in an age of doubt. But it's been my experience, sisters and brothers, that most people will listen to an authentic witness account 
over and above detached ideas from so-called experts. Blaise Pascal is considered one of the greatest minds in the history of science. But Pascal's conversion to the faith was not a product of him applying scientific principles and processes. When his carriage was once suspended on a bridge hanging between life and death, the only thing that Pascal could think of was the passionate Christian conviction of his sister and her commitment and witness to the faith, her faith in Christ. I mean, Pascal was the inventor of the barometer. He was brilliant, a, a brilliant practical scientist, a brilliant philosophical scientist. But the one thing that kept piercing his heart was not scientific law. It was the Christian witness of his sister. You know, long before the, uh, long before modern worship, there used to be this thing called worship wars. Michael and I are part of that. Anita was part of that too. That's like 20 some odd years ago. Long before Bethel music, long before uh, Passion City, long before uh, Maverick City, you know, there, were, there was a small cadre of singer-songwriters. There was uh, Amy Grant, there was Michael W. Smith, uh, Don Moen, one of my favorites, and there was a woman named Kathy Tricoli. She was one of the key stars in that. She, she's been synonymous with the growth of Christian music for well over 35 years. She was a singer, she was a songwriter, she was an author, she was a popular speaker. And she also co-wrote music and songs with well-known secular artists and entertainers. Given what she did for the bulk of her life, her adult life, you'd think that she'd grown up in a Christian, a strong Christian home. The truth is, she didn't. Her family was marginal at best. She once said that the Bible in her family was a, just a book on the end of the coffee table that was never touched. And she herself never touched it. Until one summer day in the late 70s, while working at a local community pool, swimming pool, she noticed one of the other girls who worked with her reading her Bible over lunch, every lunch break. As Kathy struck up a conversation with her coworker about her regular reading of the Bible, her friend began to answer her questions in a way that she had never, ever heard before. Kathy said, I have never heard about Jesus in the way that she described him to me. And one day, her friend came to work and gave her her own copy of the New Testament to read. And later on, before the end of the summer, her friend invited her to go to church with her, come to her church. And eventually, Kathy made the life-changing decision to be a follower of Jesus. And even though 30 years later, Kathy has been blessed with numerous Dove Awards and all kinds of accolades, Grammy nominations, her journey as a follower of Christ began because someone she worked with at the community pool authenticated the presence and the purpose of Christ with her own witness. You know, there are a lot of folks in the world, my friends, who find it hard to understand Easter. Heck, I even do sometimes. It's not an easy thing to understand the resurrection. It's not an easy thing to think about the empty tomb. Not easy to think about the resurrected Jesus. But if you're a follower of Christ, you may be the best chance that they have of meeting the resurrection Jesus. You don't have to be an expert. In fact, here's one, don't be an expert. <laughs> don't be an expert. Be a witness. Be a good witness. And like a good witness, just share what you saw. Just share what you heard. Just share what you felt. Just share 
the difference that Christ made in your life. And trust, trust, trust that Jesus will do the rest. Amen? Amen. In his letter to the Christians in Galatia, Paul wrote these words, and they are the key that I hope you will take with you out of the second chapter of Galatians. I have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's as simple as that. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, let the people of God say. Amen. Each week we have the, uh, the privilege of responding uh, to what God is, is speaking into us. Uh, yet another way to, um, to strengthen our witness in the world, to be able to, um, to not leave here the same people that we came, but to leave as changed people so that we might be a strong witness for the world. And one of the ways that we do that is through our giving. We realize that all that we have belongs to God. It's given to us by God. And so an opportunity for us to give back to God is a privilege, truly is. It also says, God, that we trust you. Uh, we trust that you will help provide for us as we help to further authenticate Christ's resurrection in the world today. So we pause to say thank you for the ways that you faithfully give so that God's message and his gospel might be known across this world. There are a variety of ways that you can give. Um, the ushers will come forward in a moment and pass the baskets. You can see on the screens there are ways that you can give electronically as well. But we do say thank you for your faithfulness as you seek to find ways to be a strong witness in this world through your giving. Let's pray. Loving God, we thank you for, uh, for who you are and who you are calling us and equipping us to be. And Lord, we pray that you would receive this offering this morning as our sacrifice of praise. God, we, we know that all that we have comes from you, and we pray that you would use these gifts and you would use them to do far greater than anything that we could ever fathom, all for your glory's sake. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. If our ushers will come forward at this time. My life flows on in endless song Above earth's lamentation I hear the sweet though far off hymn That hails the new creation Through all the tumult and the strife I hear that music ringing It finds an echo in my soul How can I keep from singing What though my joys and comforts die I know my Savior liveth what though the darkness gather round Songs in the night he giveth No storm can shake my inmost calm While to that refuge clinging If Christ is Lord of heaven and earth how can I keep from singing? I lift my eyes above the hills. 
I see the blue above it And day by day the pathway smooths Since first I learned to love it The peace of Christ makes fresh my heart A fountain ever flowing For all things are mine If I am His How can I keep from singing? No storm can shake my inmost calm While to that refuge clinging If Christ is Lord of heaven and earth How can I keep from singing? to remain standing as we join together in our closing hymn number 592. Oh Jesus, I have promised. Let us lift our voices in praise together.
gratitude to our musicians this morning who led us into the Holy of Holies and uh, encountering the, the presence of the risen Lord. Thank you to our uh, crew back there in the, uh, the, the bullpen, making sure everything works for us, both here and online, and our guest services people for welcoming you this morning and you for your presence. Now receive the benediction. Let your love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Give generously to the needs of the saints. Offer hospitality to strangers. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. For God is with us and God goes with us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace and be at peace, my friends. Amen.